First of all, beg the, for the blessings of Sal Ms. Chandamuli Maharaj, who will be assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. Um, and we will be speaking uh, on lessons in leading our lives um, in discussion through a certain aspect of the of the pastimes of the Ramayan. Uh, so I'll just say Mangala Charan and then, and then we'll begin. Okay. Omegyana Timaranda Sia, Gyananjana Shilakaya, Chakshu Militam Yena, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha, Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Kadam Ayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam. Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagujatam Sahagana Rakanatam Vitam Twam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Rade Vrindavaneshwari Rishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpaturabhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So, uh, so we have some discussion on this concept or this idea of how we can uh, enrich our own understanding, our own lives through understanding uh, some aspects of the Ramayan. And in particular, what we're going to speak about in this lesson, in this class, uh, is something about Ravana. And in, and in, in particular, <laughs> how Ravana becomes the architect of his own destiny. Uh, I was recently, I was, we were recently in a Sangha and, um, and a point that came up um, was about this idea of devotees and having balance in our lives. So balance in the sense that we can often be very analytical in order to understand so much about life and how life works and the mechanisms of, of, of life and how we are to act and the rules and so on. There's also the, the understanding of recreation and how when we have these balances, it really helps us to, to experience both the sweetness and also to endure in spiritual life. And one of the ways in which we also recreate as devotees is through hearing the pastimes of the Lord. Yeah hearing these very wonderful narratives. A and the narratives, or practically all aspects of spiritual life, have so many different dimensions to them. So, in the modern world, people talk about the power of stories. Okay. And sometimes they consider different narratives to be mythological. But we as devotees, we understand that for example, Ramayan and uh, Mahabharat, they are both itihasas. So we understand that they are actual histories. Itiha itihasa, itiahasa. Thus it happened. So these are actual histories. But the, the wonderful, the wonderful, or one of the wonderful glories of our tradition is that our, is our histories transform us. Just like in our daily lives, we have these narratives. So from our childhood, through to our youth, through to our adulthood, through to our old age, 
we have these narratives that we've experienced. And in many ways, our narratives, our history has defined us in various ways. In some ways, our history has defined us positively. So we talk about samskars. We've had some good experiences. And these good experiences have helped to set us up for further positive outcomes in our lives. But we also, we also have sometimes bad experiences, negative experiences. And those negative experience, some experiences sometimes become obstacles to our further unfoldment in spiritual life. And so one of the things that I've been meditating on a lot over the past few years especially is how in spiritual life we, we are trying to transform. We have some things which are favorable, some things which are unfavorable. The favorable aspects of our character, we engage those very, very positively to make further progress. But we also sometimes have unfavorable aspects of our character. And the question then becomes, how do we, how do we transform? One of the glories of our tradition is that both the supreme personality of Godhead and his devotees are so, are so extraordinarily brilliant that literally every aspect of our teaching is transformative if it is received in the proper way. Yeah. So therefore, we have the power of narrative. Yeah. The power of the stories. Uh, and those stories are stories that we have experienced. But even more specifically, every one of us, our character is shaped by the story that we tell ourselves at every moment in our lives. Uh, we have a story. And that story that we tell ourselves at every moment in our lives is actually not only shaping our character, it is shaping our emotions, and it is ultimately taking us to a certain type of destination. I was telling a group recently <laughs> about an experience I had a few years ago. So I was running late for a meeting, and um, I, was, I was worried because it was a very important meeting. And you know when you're running late, and you feel you're going to miss the meeting or you're going to not do well in the meeting, it can lead to stress. Anyone had that experience? So I was a bit concerned. I was feeling a little bit stressed. So I, got, I left my home late. I got to the, to the stop for the bus. And as I was getting there, I could see the bus was just about to leave. So I was going to be even more late. Um, but luckily, someone on the bus pressed the buzzer, so the bus had to stop. So I took the opportunity to get, to get on the bus and to pay my fare. When I got on the bus, as I was walking past, the bus driver said something negative to me. I didn't actually know what she'd said. All I knew was it wasn't good, right? Um, so think about this. Stressed out, running late, an important meeting. You just got on your mode of transport. Now you're getting some negative comment from the bus driver. I went back to the bus driver, I said to her, so what did you just say to me? And then she said something even more negative. And so I was there being insulted by the bus driver. And it's one thing when you're, when you're, when you're being criticized, you know, and it's just you and the person who's criticizing you. But then when you see other people watching you being criticized, that makes it even more intense. So I wasn't in a good mood. <laughs> but, but what was interesting, so I, I, I went and sat down. But then I, re I remembered at this gone London around that time, just before that time, I had given a seminar on forgiveness <laughs> of, all, of all topics. <laughs> so, so I thought, okay, you have, to, you have to practice what you preach. So I went back to the bus driver and I said, I'm, I'm sorry if, I've, if, if you're upset by what I've done, by anything I've done. <sighs> Now, what was really interesting, and this relates to where we're going with this in this class, then she apologized to me. 
and then she explained what had been happening in her life and in that particular day. So one of the things she said is that the bus drivers, they have a schedule. So they have to reach a, a particular point on the journey by a certain time. Otherwise, they get some negative feedback from the company. The second thing she pointed out, and I'd seen this, I've seen this personally. Sometimes, at least in London, when people are bus drivers, the public, they may have a bad day, be in a bad mood, so they'll get insulted. You know, people will get on the bus and they'll just shout at the bus driver, insult the bus driver, swear at the bus driver. So throughout the day, she'd been receiving insults, random insults from people, strangers. Then she explained to me, I believe that the organization, they were, they were looking to make people redundant, to get rid of some of the staff. So that was on her mind. And, and I, I can't remember if it was her or a relative had some health issue. So she didn't mention that. By the time I got to the stop where I was meant to leave, I wasn't upset with her at all. And it got me thinking about this point. This point is that the narrative. So I was feeling one way, but when I understood the backstory, when I understood the circumstances around that, right? So you have, an in, you have a situation, but then you frame the situation, then you have a deeper insight into what is going on. And it really got me thinking about the narratives that we carry in our lives. Right? So we, we are not upset by what happens to us. We're upset by the story that we've built around what's happened to us. In the modern world, one of the biggest reasons why people have a, have a negativity about religion or spirituality is that they think that God is unfair. They think that we are trying to lead, lead a pious life and all these bad things happen. I remember as a child reading a newspaper article, front page. It was about a vicar who had been very dedicated in his tr Christian tradition. And his daughter had died in a car crash. Right? It was a, he'd been in the car crash. He'd survived. But his daughter had died in the car crash. And his conclusion was, therefore, I, I, I reject God. Yeah. So in the modern world, one of the things that we see, and, and, and our scriptures really talk about this, or, or close this gap, is that people don't have the full story. You understand? And that, unfortunately, is the story of our lives. Oftentimes, we don't have the full story. The scripture is very powerful in this regard. Because when you hear and see different personalities in the scriptures, the scripture will often give you the full story. So we're going to go into the full story or some greater aspect of Ravana. Because there's a backstory to Ravana. You know, as wretched as his behaviors were, there's even, there's even further context to why he was in the situation that he was in. Okay, so we're going to share some, some particular points as to how Ravana picked up <laughs> various curses. Yeah which caused or presented or prepared him for his own destruction. And we call this, um, this um, class Lessons in Leading Your Life. Huh? So we were explaining in the previous Sangha that people often forget that there is a time delay between action and reaction. Right? Because even now you see people and they're doing something wrong, and everything seems to be going right. right. And then the question comes up, why do bad things happen to good people? Right? Or you can flip it in the other way. Why do good things happen to bad people? But actually, our, our Supreme Lord and the order of the universe is unlimitedly just. Yeah? It's just a matter of time. So, we're going to get into some of these particular activities of Ravana. And um, it was a really wonderful class by Maharaj this morning. And he was explaining this point about the, um, the different incarnations of Jai and Vijay as they came as different demons and how they represent different anatas. And so Maharaj was explaining how Ravana represents what? Lust. Right? And they're... <laughs> There's so many different um, 
indications of that. So our story will begin here. So um, there's this pastime where Ravana and his Rakshasha um, associates, um, they're flying through the sky. Right? And Ravana is actually flying on, on this golden chariot. And this chariot is actually a chariot that um, is, we say chariot, but it's actually more like a kind of a huge kind of palatial environment. And he had actually taken this um, from um, Kuvera. Uh, he'd be, in fact, in this pastime, he was returning from a fight with Kuvera. And Kuvera is actually his brother. Right? So he'd returned from a fight and he'd actually taken this, this golden chariot from Kuvera. And so what he wanted to do is Ravana wanted to um, indicate or rather he wanted to establish his supremacy right, over the entire universe. So he'd already gone to the heavens, and in the heavens he'd conquered different um, entities. So, for example, the Gandharvas, Yakshas, he'd conquered them in order to really establish that he was the supreme in, in, in the heavenly um, places. Now, it's interesting. We, we understand that you can tell a person by their association. And... In my own life, one of the things I, I'm trying to do more and more is, is to introspect. Right? One of the things I'm trying to do more and more is to introspect and especially to see what triggers me. Right? So when you have a situation and you find that you're triggered, it, it, a, a situation or an individual that elicits a strong reaction, right? then you can look back and think, why do I react so strongly? Marge was talking about envy. Right? And actually, um, His Holiness Chan Muraj was very kind enough to spend some time with the disciples of Bhakti Tirtha Um This was a few weeks back, and uh, he was talking about the, the Anatas and that the last one to go is this desire for fame. And Maharaj was explaining how because it's because everyone in the material world wants to be worshipped, right? worshipable. Right? So we want to play God, right? and that's the root of it. So I was just also examining my heart and triggers and thinking, what situations trigger me? What situations cause me to react very strongly uh, in a positive or negative way? And what does that teach me about myself? Uh, it's interesting as Ravana and his Rakshashas, as they're returning from this battle of Kuvera, they, they actually see below them great rishis and sages. Right? And, and it becomes a trigger, right? So these Rakshasha demons, when you see these very kind of austere sages performing sacrifices, it is almost like the, the shadow, the opposite side of the spectrum. What would they do? So as they would see these sages, they would actually drop volumes of blood, they would drop feces, and they would actually drop urine to defile the sacrificial um, arenas and they'd even kill these particular sages. Huh? So we always see that there is this battle in the modern world between the divine and the demoniac. Huh? This, this is, everything is, 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 a, is a lesson if we're able to understand it. It is said that at a particular point in time, you would have the divine and the demoniac in different universes. Right? Then as time went on, they would be on different planets. As time went on, they would be on different land masses. As time went on, they would be in different families or communities. Huh? As time went on, they would be in different individuals. Interestingly enough, in Kali Yuga, we have the divine and the demoniac within ourselves. I, I remember having an experience whereby when I would see someone do something that I didn't like. If I criticize them either externally or internally, very soon after that, Krishna will put me in a, in a situation where I would display that same bad quality. Yeah. And I, I could see that it was Krishna's way of showing me, don't think that you're better than these people. You're the same. It's just that when these things are, by the mercy of Krishna, those anathas may not manifest. But if you feel that you're superior to other people, better than other people, then Krishna has to show you, no, no, 
you actually you are not superior to anyone. Right? So the universe has this way of humbling every one of us. Right? Has this way of humbling. And, and we can choose to move positively and consciously in that direction. Right? This Trinada peace of Nietzsche in the respecting everyone, not expecting respect for ourselves, or life itself actually takes on that particular arrangement in order to humble us. And this is what happened to Ravana. Hmm? He was being humbled through the, through the experiences that he went through. So, these Rakshashas would kill these um, sages, they would defecate on them and so on. As they were flying through, Ravana, interesting this point about lust, Ravana spoiled the female. Right? So you spoiled the female and she was sitting by herself in meditation. Okay, and she was wearing a, a black deer skin. And, and she, was, she was chanting on with folded palms. And so at first he couldn't see her very clearly. He was curious because she was sitting alone in this particular um, region. So he was curious and wanted to understand more about this particular person. As he approached even more, he noticed that she was very attractive. Right? So you have a lusty male in the presence of a very attractive female. Right? So what did he decide, what did he want to do? He wanted to enjoy with this particular person. Right? So being a demon, so Ravana has ten heads, you know, many arms, but he has these mystic cities. So he actually disguised himself, and then, the, and then he approached the female. The female's name was Vedavati. Okay, so that was her name. And she actually uh, was a daughter of a sage. Right? And that sage who she was a daughter of, he was the son of, or one of the sons of Brahaspati. So she was in meditation. And because of her meditation and her austerity, she also had certain kinds of um, inner abilities or capabilities. So... Um, when Ravana approached her to try and understand who are you, etc., and she explained to him that she's an incarnation of the Vedas. And she went on to explain to Ravana that many, uh, many men before had approached him in order to gain her hand in marriage. But she had said, and she mentioned this to Ravana, that she was only for Vishnu, and she would only accept Vishnu as her spouse. Okay, And she was in meditation, in order to await the favor of her Lord. Okay. Now, this, this point itself is interesting, okay, because she'd been meditating for thousands of years. There's, there's, there's a power that comes from austerity. In the modern world, as people are trying to understand how to develop character, we've forgotten the power of austerity, the power of discipline, uh, and the strength, the power, the potency that comes as we continually try to live by higher principles, by higher values. Yeah. Prabhupada would also mention this point, excuse me, about Gandhari. Because she performed this austerity that because her husband, Dhritarashtra, was blind, born blind, she would keep this blindfold on. Right? So she would keep her eyes like, covered to the point that when her um, son, Duryodhana, was told to approach her, she had this ability that by perceiving him, that vision of hers against his body would make his body impenetrable. Right? So austerity actually brings a certain type of power. Right? And that power, that, that sense of doing the right thing, living by higher principles, it is actually the power that runs and allows the entire world to work. Yeah. Marge was talking about people and, and the, the, lack of, uh, the lack of harmony sometimes in relationships, right? Because people are not necessarily like-minded. Uh, in the modern world, where people talk about even doing things according to your talents or your nature, they often talk about the guna, guna aspect. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says something very interesting, guna karma. So karma, so he says, by your, by your qualities and by your work, right, your activities. 
there is another aspect or meaning to this idea of karma. And again, it relates to the pastimes of Ravan and what he did. This is where the, the Sankatan mission becomes so powerful. In the modern world, you will often see people who have a certain quality, a certain character, a certain nature, right? Guna. And they may even work towards a particular outcome, okay? So they're active. And they may get nothing. You understand? I was listening to a, a lecture by Prabhupada. It was, actually, it was actually very touching, very heartbreaking. So Prabhupada is talking about the modern world and how the earth, because of sinful activity, she will withdraw her resources. Right? You see that point? Because people are not performing yagya, not performing sacrifices, not behaving properly, being unrighteous, being impious, that the earth itself will withdraw her resources. He said there'll be famines, there'll be droughts, all of these things. But the most powerful thing about how he finished the sentence, right? he says, therefore just try to save them. So without understanding the full sentence, you could feel that he's condemning modern society. Yeah, they're going to be punished, right? They're going to suffer. There's going to be lack of resources because these people are sinful. But he takes it to that ultimate conclusion. We don't want them to suffer, though. Right? We don't want them to suffer. Therefore, just try to save them. Everything is working by this austerity. What do I mean by that? So you have an individual in the modern world who has the guna, the nature to do something, right? Let's say they've got the nature for business. But because of impiety, what happens is very interesting. Even though you've got the ability to do business, you don't have the piety to get any outcome from your behavior. Does that make sense? So you can have someone with, with a skill, but they've got no piety. Therefore, there's no outcome. Now, what Prabhupada has done in this Sankirtan movement is absolutely extraordinary. Why? And this is, this is a key lesson for us. Because either you've got karma to have an outcome, right? Even material karma. Let's say you've been materially pious, therefore you've got material karma to get some outcome for some, for some future activity. But if you don't have material piety, there is one other way that things can work out. And that is by creeper. Right? You understand? So either you can get something by karma or you can get something by creeper. Prabhupada, is, he has created a movement which is actually uh, holding up not just the spiritualists, not just the devotees, but is actually holding up the entire world society by giving to the world a, a, form, a superior form of piety which is counteracting the impiety of the modern society. Isn't that amazing? Therefore, Prabhupada says two things came to mind. He said that there should have been a third world war. It, you, many of you will have heard that, that statement. He said, but that's been averted because of the Sankirtan mission. Right? And then he also said that this Iskon movement will go down in history as being the movement that saved the entire world. So, so a, a key lesson for us, this idea of leading, you know, extracting lessons from our lives. Prabhupada says that, that, that uh, impossible is a word in the false dictionary. But, but, the, but the dynamics of that is because for someone who has tried to engage in devotional service, by the mercy of great devotees, one is able to supplement even one's karmic situation in order to achieve something that we do not have the karma to achieve. And, and, and when the question comes up, what does this movement do for the, for the modern society? The answer is everything. The answer is actually everything. Huh? If, we, if we're able to believe our teachings and, and, and reflect on our teachings, what we will understand is that even the material prosperity of the world is actually due to the blessings and the, and the credits that has entered into the world through this Sankirtan mission. Uh, so the flourishing on all levels is actually most 
powerfully achieved when the devotees come together and engage in the Sankirtan mission of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So there is this Sankirtan Yajna, and that is the greatest Yajna possible. And it works on the, mic on the macrocosm, wider society, the human society, but it also works in the microcosm of our lives. So the more that we can engage in spiritual austerity according to our level, the more your own life flourishes and is actually flourishing in ways that we may not be able to comprehend. Okay. So these austerities make a person powerful. So this Vedavati, she's very powerful by these thousands of years of austerity in order to attain um, the mercy of Vishnu. Okay. So she tells, she tells Ravana, just go on your way. I'm meant for, I'm meant for Lord Vishnu. Ravana hates Vishnu. No surprise there, right? So, he actually derides Vishnu. And this angers Vedavati. Okay? And this is another natural emotion. Huh? Where there's love and where there's relationship, it pains the heart to see the person that you love being mistreated, being insulted. Huh? But there's various ways that we can respond to that. So we see, for example, that someone, and in the case of um, Vedavati, Ravana, he just grabs her by the hair. Right? And this is the nature of demons. The nature of the demon is to try to take anything that belongs to God. Yeah? Anything that belongs to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they just want to claim it as their own. Right? And therefore also, even those people who are engaged in the service of the Lord, the, the demoniac mentality is to try to take those people away from the Lord's service and to enjoy those personalities. Huh? Um, so what happens is Ravana just grabs her by the hair and she becomes angry. And then Vedavati because of her austerities and her mystic ability, she uses her hand and she just cuts her hair off, cuts the locks off. But then she tells Ravana something very interesting. And this is just one of the curses that he accumulates in this series of pastimes. She says to him that because you've defiled my body by touching me, right? so she actually, she, she, she actually, through her anger, she says, you've insulted me, therefore... I'll take birth to destroy you and to destroy your entire race. And then what she does is by, she invokes the fire from within her and her body just burns to ashes. So that she actually just leaves the world, but he's just taken on this particular curse. So our interactions with each other, everything that we do with each other, actually sets ourselves up for some future experience. And there are no accidents. Huh? So we are the architects of our own destiny. Huh? For better or for worse. So she leaves in that particular way. Then, um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Great point. So there's two ways in which this works. So our previous activities create the backdrop, okay? And then how we respond to that situation. In other words, I do something which creates a, a situation for me in the future. Now, when I enter into that situation, how I respond to that situation is down to my free will. I'll give an example. So, uh, uh, let's see if we can give a, an example that's sufficiently clear. I remember serving His Holiness to Mal Christian Raj. So we were, he had come to the UK um, and he was staying in Cambridge and doing his PhD. And um, at one, one day, because we were cleaning his house, <laughs> one day his servants, they, they were cooking for him. And they decided to make um, this rice dish. They were, they, were, they were trialing it. 
So it didn't quite work in the way that they wanted and they threw the grains away and he chastised them. And he was saying that if you, if you waste grains, then in the future time you can be born in poverty, in a poverty situation, right? Because by wasting the earth's resources, that's a, you, know, you get into a situation where you lack resources, right? Now we can follow that through. You can say, well, you know, I know people who have been brought up in poor environments, right? Who were born in, in, in environments where they didn't have much resources. One group of individuals, the way that they react to that is they think, okay, let me be very careful about my resources. Let me look after everything very carefully. Let's do the best with what we have. Let us not waste anything, right? You have another group of individuals, they're still wasteful and they spend their whole life complaining about how they were disadvantaged, right? And they may even go on to live a life, lead a life of crime. It's the same situation, right? But how the individuals respond to those situations, that is our free will. That is our free will. So we always have a choice. And the only way through the results of our bad karma is to behave properly in the here and now. That's how, that's how the world, this is how the world really works. This is how the world really works. The only way to counteract the results or to come through the results of my previous imperfect behaviors is to behave properly now. Uh, yes, Maharaj. True. Very true. Yeah. I mean, there's also an internal reaction. I remember Maharaj was, t I can't remember where it was, but Maharaj was talking about how he would make, sh he has a, ha and I have, I could relate because I was brought up in a similar way, never to leave the lights on, never to leave the, the water running and so on. Because my parents were always like, if you do, it's just very wasteful, we shouldn't waste things. And so we have samskars, we have a certain habit. When we do something wrong, when we act sinfully, not only is there a reaction, but it also creates a tendency for more of those negative behaviors. So not only are we fighting the reaction that comes, but we're now fighting the tendency to do something which is also inc incorrect. Uh, so it takes time to steer ourselves away from a pattern of behavior that we may have previously linked ourselves to, which is imperfect, but which is actually now acting against our ultimate well-being. And we see this even amongst devotees. Right? So we, I was thinking this the other day. Our issue as, as aspiring spiritualists is not so much that we are in the world. That's not our issue as much as the fact that the world is actually inside us. The worldly mentality is actually something that's functioning within us. And we're trying to remove that worldly mentality, that mentality of trying to control and enjoy the world and trying to re-steer ourselves in such a way that we understand that the real self and the real pleasure lies in rendering service to the Lord. Was that the sense in which you meant this, Marge, or is it something you'd like to elaborate on? It's okay. True, yes, yes. So, So Prabhupada gives the analogy of the fan. So even if you unplug the fan, it doesn't stop it like that. There is still this sense that things are winding down. Uh, but it does actually wind down. A and we can see that. If we try to practice devotional service sincerely, we can see over time, definitely over time, that certain habits, certain behaviors that we may have had slowly, slowly the reactions to those behaviors, they also start to, start to change externally. Right? But there is that period, because life is like that. There is the action, there is a period of delay, and then there is actually the reaction. Yeah. So it requires, and this is one of the things which is so transformative about the Shastra, it requires to see the world through the eyes of Shastra. Because without seeing the world through the eyes of Shastra, we can think, I'm doing good, I'm getting bad. Why should I continue? If we see the world through the eyes of Shastra, we can understand I'm doing good, and that reaction or that ramification will take place. But 
we are divided by time. Yeah. So, Vedavati, she meditates on Vishnu, she, her body burns to ashes, and she leaves the world. Ravana, he just carries on. He just moves on with his um, army of demon rakshashas. And as they're moving forward, they come to, they, they're in the Himalayas, and they're harassing the different rishis and the sages in the Himalayas. But at a certain point, Ravana's um, chariot, it stops, and, and he realizes that the chariot is not able to move forward further. And he's confused about what is going on. Why is it not able to, why are we not able to move further? And he starts to explore what's going on. And he sees an individual. And they are at the point which is just um, at the beginning of the, uh, Mount Kailash. And so the individual says to him, you know, this, you're, come to, you're at the abode of Kailash, you cannot move forward any further. Okay? And the individual who stops him, his name is Nandi. Right? So he's the servant of Lord Shiva. And so um, Ravana, he just actually, when he sees Nandi, Nandi has a certain form at the time. Right? He has a, a, a head of a monkey, he has a very unusual form. And so Ravana is very kind of um, uh, derisive towards him and derisive towards Lord Shiva. Okay? And of course, as a servant of Shiva, Nandi, hearing this kind of derision of, of Lord Shiva, he becomes also very, very angry. Okay? And uh, Ravana also insults Nandi because of the, his features and so on. So Nandi also curses Ravana. And he says to him, as you disregard me in my monkey form, there will also be a race of monkeys who will annihilate your entire race. Uh, so he, he receives this... this additional curse from Nandi. Um, now, it's interesting Ravana's response to that. He just disregards the curse. Yeah. It's, very, it, it's very interesting that when people are intoxicated and when, when there is arrogance and pride, you cannot see things clearly. It, it, this actually relates to the modes. It, it's, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing way of understanding the world through the vision of the Shastra. What happens in the modes... To use an analogy that Marge gave earlier, which I think is interesting. If, if people are entering into a relationship and there's too much of a desire to enjoy, what happens is it invokes the mode of passion. In the mode of passion, we cannot see things clearly. Because in the mode of passion, I cannot see the person for who they are. I only see them in terms of how I can enjoy them. Right? So lust, right? greed. Huh? So this mode of passion, it actually changes the vision of the world, right? Because in lower modes, we don't see the world as the world actually is. And therefore, very interesting, when, when, when Krishna is speaking about um, in the Bhagavad Gita, and he talks about approaching the spiritual master, he says it's Tattvadashi, right? One who can actually see. How are we able to see? The most powerful way to see the world is to see the world through scripture. If you see the world through scripture, and it, it, honest, it's like a code breaker. You can actually decode things. You can look at it and think, mm, what does the scripture say about this? Right? And you can start to decode it through scripture and it allows you to see a whole range of other things that you would not necessarily be able to perceive. I was actually thinking about doing a seminar on this point, because uh, uh, over the years, what I've seen is different things in the scripture, whether it's varnas, whether it's um, the modes of material nature, there's so many things in the scripture which allow you to kind of, it's almost like pulling the glasses on through a certain lens and thinking, okay, I get it. If this, uh, if this person is acting in the mode of passion, for example, it means that the activity that they're doing is gonna begin like nectar and it's gonna end like poison, right? It's just the trajectory of the mode of passion. Right? Someone else, you see them, they're a pious person, they're working very hard. Okay, so they're acting in the mode of goodness. So they're doing all of this hard work up front. But because they're doing the right activity at the right time, in the right way, they're acting in the mode of goodness. Even though in the beginning it's a struggle, what's going to happen in the longer term? Good results. Right? Pious material results. Because the material energy itself has a trajectory. And, and, and the teachings, our teachings allow you to see the invisible. 
It is absolutely incredible, honestly. And you can see and decode the world and literally predict what's going to happen. Right now, one of the biggest things in technology, they call this big data or data analytics. They try to predict things. They try to take literally millions of pieces of data and use that to look for patterns and to predict what's going on and how things are gonna, are gonna play out. Right? And, and the most powerful form of predictive analytics is actually the Vedic literatures. It is the most powerful way of predicting what's gonna happen. There was a study, and there was a study about it, different cities and different in, um, locations, and they were looking at crime. And they found that those locations which had more greenery, right, had more nature, that the people who lived in those locations, there were lower incidences of crime, right? So they came to the conclusion that it was because of, you know, if you, pl if you, if you, um, if you have more greenery and more plants and so on. And that's partially true. But when we look at it through the lens of scripture, what we understand is, no, it's the mode of goodness. If you invoke a greater degree of the mode of goodness, that higher mode of goodness is going to impact on people's consciousness. When the mode of goodness is, is increased, it impacts on people's consciousness. They tend more to do less deviant things and more towards behaving properly. So if you have that code breaker, then you can understand what's really making it work. Right? And then you can increase that and you can expand that. Okay, so we'll plant trees, we'll open more libraries, we'll give people more education, and therefore you can intensify that mode and you can actually shift the entire behavior of that location. Right? This is, this is, this is, and this is just one aspect of the brilliance of our teachings. So Krishna consciousness is applied spirituality. Right? And it really has to be applied. Otherwise, what can happen, and what does happen to many devotees, is that we hear the philosophy, we apply it improperly, and, and instead of thinking the problem was I didn't apply it properly, the conclusion that we will reach is that the philosophy is wrong. You understand the point? Right? So it's like, I'm, tr I'm trying so hard to be a devotee, nothing's working out, Krishna must be wrong. Right? The philosophy must be wrong. And that's when the faith starts to go down. Right? What, 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 what's actually happening, the, the philosophy is perfect. I mean, it, it, I, mean, I mean, it's perfect. But what's imperfect is our application of it. Hmm? And, and we need to understand that more and more and more. And therefore, it has implications for our faith. Um, the Goswamis have explained that faith... Um, it, it gives two things, virya and smriti, which is really interesting. Virya means drive or determination, right? And smriti, this is, by the, this is explained by the Goswami, smriti is the ability to hold the meaning of the scriptures, right? To hold that within our consciousness, right? So if you want to have a life where you feel excited and driven and inspired, it is really about developing our faith. And one of the simplest ways to develop faith is to consistently and to properly apply the scriptures with the proper vision. Right? When we consistently and properly apply the scriptures with the proper vision, uh, with, with a refined vision, in good association, you'll see miracles will happen all the time. I, I shared with some devotee friends of mine, and I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this. We were at a disciples retreat with His Holiness Child in William March. This was years ago. I think it was, um, I can't remember whether it was Slovenia or another country. And just before we, I left, we asked Marge for um, permission to leave and, and for blessings. And I said to Marge, Marge, is there any last instruction? And then Marge told me something which is absolutely correct, absolutely correct about my character. He said, yes, he said, um, he said, you... You have, he said, Buddha Bhavna, you have the kind of character where you need to try and do things in, in a different way, right? To preach in a different way. So try something new. And then Marge gave me the analogy of the old wine in new bottles, right? So Marge was telling me about the, um, the importance and of trying to find new ways to present the philosophy, present Krishna consciousness in ways which are attractive to the, to the modern world in order to bring more people. And absolutely true. 
absolutely true. From my own introspection, you know, so many things that I've been told by other people, things that my own spiritual must, I definitely have that nature. I'm always thinking, how can we, how can we, how can we explain the, how can you say it in a different way? How can you package it differently so it will have an impact on people? And, and, and it, will, it will cause them to think, let's, let's look into this a bit more. Let's come closer. Let's, let's explore this teaching. And, and I was just thinking, the, the, the power of good association, the power of insight. Because you can take Krishna consciousness on the surface and just say, you practice your devotional service. Absolutely true. But in good association and with reflection, you understand how to, how to personalize your practice of Krishna consciousness. And that's why I really love this point. The point that Maharaj made towards the end of the class uh, this morning, I also heard the same point, I believe it was from Pankaj Jankari. He also said that in first canto, Prabhupada says that the spiritual master should understand the nature of the disciple and engage them accordingly. And I was thinking just how powerful the movement will be if we were more personal. Hmm? If we took this Krishna consciousness and thought how to more apply this teaching personally in my day-to-day -day life to make it even more of an, of an exhilarating experience. Because if you're happy in your Krishna consciousness, you don't even have to tell people. The happiness that the devotee has is so powerful and so substantial, that powerful energy just, just attracts people and, and it does the preaching for us. Huh? These are all lessons for our own lives. Huh? So we want this, and, and uh, that's also why Bhakti Tirtamaj was so, so much hammering this point. The Institute for Applied, Applied Spiritual Technology, to take the teachings and to look to see, how do I live this? And then to be conscious and see that every time you live it, over time, you see distinct powerful, clear results. And that result gives you even more enthusiasm to live it even more deeply because it's like, wow, I just applied a small amount of it and just look at the amazing outcome that I got. This is absolutely incredible. Therefore, what else is there in this teaching so I could take that, apply it, live it, because if this is what I'm getting with, with applying 1%, what could happen at 5%, 10%, 15%? Huh? And what is the essence of, of all these Vedic rituals and, and teachings? The essence of all of it is to chant the holy names of Krishna. Right? And, what is, and what is even the essence of Daivi Varnashram? Right? The essence of Daivi Varnashram is this simple living and higher thinking for the sake of making progress in Krishna consciousness. So, honestly, we have an amazing opportunity as devotees. And I personally don't think we take any advantage we take hardly any advantage of what we've been given. I'll give you one simple example. So two years ago at work, we were flown to Florida because for, for in terms of my day-to-day -day, um, occupation, we teach leadership. So we teach leadership to managers. So we had, there was a course that we had changed and we were flown to America, to Tampa, Florida in order to understand more about how, they, how, how to teach this new course to managers. At the end, at the end of the teaching, right, at the end of the course and, and the learning, we were brought into another room and by one of our senior managers, and, and we were introduced to a yoga teacher. And then the yoga teacher took us through this, this um, like guided meditation practice. And it was about 15 minutes long, but by the time I, I, by the time I finished the, um, we finished the practice, I felt like I'd been asleep for an hour, right? It was, it was that recharging. And, and then the yoga teacher went on to explain that the, basically what she had taken us through was an exercise which is pratyahara, right? So it's part of the, of the Ashtanga yoga process. And the idea is to withdraw the senses, right? To kind of go a bit more internal. And the reason why it struck me, and I was telling devotees about this recently, is because as I was thinking about this over the years, I realized, it was something I realized about myself primarily, but then I started to look at the devotees and I thought, wow, I get it now. I can see one of the reasons why we struggle so hard as devotees, right? So what happens as devotees, we're so much, 
We're so much attached to the world that we're always on. You understand? Like it's always, we're always on. How many of you have ever had this experience that even when you go to sleep, you struggle just to get to sleep because your mind's still buzzing? There's so many things going on. Who had that experience? Yeah. So, so this is, and this is why Prabhupada spoke about this simple living and higher thinking so much. Because he knew that in order for the devotees to be able to focus more internally and to go deeper in their sp- practice, they can't be in a situation where you're so nervous and tense all the time because your day-to-day life is so intense. The average person looks at their mobile phone at least 150 times a day. So it creates a sense of nervousness which also affects the mind. I remember, this was 1999, Radhastami. Tamal Krishnamaraj was giving a class and he said something which always struck me. He said that he feels that practically everyone who comes to Krishna consciousness can make it all the way. We can all go back home, back to Godhead. Amazing thing to say. He said, but in many cases we fail. He said, I don't think the devotees get the chanting wrong. He said, I don't think that that's why we fail. He said, often because the devotees are not situated properly in their varna and ashram, he said, therefore their minds are not peaceful Therefore, the chanting becomes difficult. So when I heard Maharaj talk about this disturbance, how some of these other things, if we don't do them properly, they lead to disturbance in our spiritual lives. It got me thinking that, yes, the chanting of the holy names is a lifestyle choice. There's a lifestyle that's actually either supportive of or makes it difficult to engage in the chanting with more depth. So yes, in the beginning stages, When we preach, what do we tell people? Just add Krishna, right? Just add the chanting. But if you've been practicing for 20 or 30 years and you're still just adding chanting, there's something wrong, right? If we've been practicing for 20, 30 years, we should have moved and evolved so that more of our lives is adjusted in such a way that it is favorable. And therefore, if we take that to heart and we move in that direction, amazing things will happen to us in Krishna consciousness. And it's all available. I personally have seen, at least in this movement, at least with the devotees who I've interacted with, we've, we've not even begun to take advantage of Prabhupada's teachings. And the funny thing is, if you don't take advantage of it, you, I guarantee you the outside people, if they understood a, if they understood a fraction of what was in, the, in Prabhupada's books, they would take a fa- advantage and run ahead of us. When I told my colleagues at work, when I told my, my first manager that I practiced meditation, he he immediately was scheming to see how we can leverage that th- in the firm. They're, they're that quick. They're that quick. But if you told the devotees, no one's going to bat an eyelid. It's, like, it's a big deal. Yeah, seriously. Right? It's absolutely amazing. Anyway, we'll come back to that maybe a little bit later on. So, so, um, so the curse has been there by Nandi because of the arrogance of Ravana. Now, Ravana, in his arrogance, not only does he just ignore Nandi, he then thinks, you know what, I'm just going to pick up this mountain, Mount Kailash. And he does. He picks up Mount Kailash. But as he picks up Mount Kailash, what happens? His picking up Mount Kailash meant that Parvati, who's with, who's with Shiva, she gets um, dispositioned, right? So she gets shaken. And she clings to Shiva for support. And Shiva says to her, says, don't worry, right? This person is just, is just this demon Ravana, right? He can do you no harm. Right? But she's angry now. Right? So again, Ravana, <laughs> he, picks, uh, he actually um, receives another curse. She says that as he's frightened a woman by his violence, his death will be caused by a female. Right? And then what Shiva does is Shiva just uses his, his, his t- big toe and presses down on the mountain. The moment Shiva presses down on Mount Kailash, Ravana's, because he's got you know, so many arms, the, mount, the mountain just exerts this great pressure, and Ravana's arms are trapped under the mountain, right? And he's in extraordinary pain. So what happens then is that Ravana's ministers, they know what's going on, so they advise him that the reason this is, this is Shiva's abode, and, you know, obviously he's not pleased, and so, but Shiva, he's, you know, very, he's compassionate, so you should just appease him. Um, so Ravana, he know, he's, he's learned, he knows Shastra, right? So he recites, I think it's the Samaveda, right, in order to appease um, um, Shiva. 
This happens for some time, though. Shiva doesn't get at peace straight away, right? It, it actually takes him a while. So eventually, um, Shiva is um, appeased. And so Shiva relents. It's after, after hundreds of years, right? Or at least 100 years plus that Shiva then relents. And um, then Ravana actually has a, um, an audience with Shiva. And Shiva, you know, Shiva, you know, lets him go and so on. But Ravana, being an opportunistic person, and you also know this, this in the material world, people can be very, very opportunistic. Not only does, um, you know, Shiva fig, um, a, uh, let Ravana go, but Ravana takes the opportunity to ask Shiva for a weapon, for his weapon. Yeah. And Shiva gives it to him. But there's a, there's a really interesting lesson here. Shiva gives him the weapon called the Pushpata, and the Pashupata, sorry. And at the same time as he's given the, we the weapon, Ravana internally within his mind is also given the mantras used to, um, in order to make that weapon work. But the reason why Shiva's given him the weapons is because Shiva knows that him having these weapons will just actually prepare himself to, for his demise ultimately. So, so in life, you should never think that when bad people are so-called gaining something and they're continuing that trajectory, don't take things at face value. Right? Sometimes the, the very thing that they've been given will actually be the cause of the person's own correction. Huh? There's always this delay between activity or action and reaction. Huh? And the... And the vision of the devotee is to understand that nothing negative can cause a positive outcome, ultimately. Yeah. The only thing that gives an ultimately auspicious result is by behaving according to Krishna's law and most importantly, for the pleasure of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the only thing that's worked in the past. This, the only thing that's working now and it's actually the only thing that's going to work in the future. Yeah? It's the only thing that works. This is actually how the material world works. Yeah? We're so lucky for a number of reasons. I, I have a friend who was just, um, he, he was learning some metaphysics actually, like, but Vedic metaphysics. So subtle sciences, right? So you have things like astrology or different things. And I was just thinking that he, he had received some insight and he'd applied certain things and his life had changed in some positive direction. But, but, but something came to me that was very interesting about what was going on. Because you could look at it and think, well, what do you need for spirituality then? If you can adjust certain things materially, that's enough to make things work. Not quite. The, the special quality of Krishna consciousness is that in life, there are three ways that you can make an intervention. You can intervene on the gross level, okay? So you try to change something in the gross material world. That's one way of changing. Above that, there is subtle intervention, right? So people may um, use mantras to try and change the situation. They may use different kinds of subtle intervention. I have, um, I have a, f a friend, and she does vastu. And um, she was telling me how one of her, one of her um, clients is like the CEO of this big bank, right? Like dealing with literally billions of pounds or dollars. And I was thinking, yeah, of course, because they know actually that these subtle things make a difference, right? So not, they don't tell everyone, but sometimes really powerful individuals, I mean really powerful materialists, they go around searching for all of these different metaphysical and, and, and subtle things which are in the Vedas because, and, they, and they tell no one just in order to get a competitive advantage. One devotee friend of mine, he, was, um, he told me personally, we were speaking at Iskon London. We were sitting on the roof of the, um, of the temple and he told me how um, he had been approached by a secret society, right? So someone from that secret society had, had um, somehow they'd seen that he knows Bhagavad Gita. And so they, 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 had, um, they had approached him and asked him to come and speak on the Bhagavad Gita. And so he had spoken at the secret society for a, on a number of occasions on the Bhagavad Gita. 
and they'd been taking notes, asking questions, because they really wanted to understand this deeper, this, this deeper knowledge. So there is the gross intervention, then above that there is the subtle intervention, but what we have access to, which we don't take advantage of, and we don't understand the power of it, is divine intervention. What actually happens in Christian consciousness is literally a science of divine intervention. If you, if you do something genuinely spiritual, what happens is it then, it then has an effect on the subtle aspect and it has an effect eventually on the gross levels of reality as well. Right? That's how it works. If you please a pure devotee, and this is why association is so important, if we hear from pure devotees, so we're getting a chance to do now. If we, if, we, if we serve pure devotees, if we please pure devotees, the blessing has effects on the subtle and even on the gross. So sometimes the question comes up, well, you know, but I'm trying this material thing or I'm doing this subtle thing. But the question we should ask ourselves is, how did you even know this was available? So Krishna says, Sarvasa chaham ridishani vishto mata smiti jnana mapohanam cha. The very fact that we have the ability to even hear about these possibilities, that's divine intervention. That's divine intervention. Krishna is actually giving us all types of very rare knowledge that practically most of human society has never even heard of. And practically they don't have access to. And they don't have the karma for it either. The only way it becomes available to them is if someone who has that spiritual credit, i.e. the devotees, intervenes in the karma of human society by making that esoteric knowledge available to them. And therefore we have the Sankirtan mission. So the reason why we're saying this, and we'll stop in a moment, is to just help us to understand the gifts that we have. People, we can say anything we like, but you can, tell, you can tell how much people have realized what they have by what they do with it, not what they say about it. Right? You, can, you can understand how much you understand what you have by what you do with it, not what you say about it. So if we take that as a litmus test, we don't know what we've been given. Right? And, th and that's the greatest trick of the material energy. Give the, make them millionaires and still have them living like homeless people. Right? Give them everything and have them living in a way that they don't even understand what they've been given, what to speak of taking advantage of it. Right? So that's, the, that's, like, that's our curse. Right? That's our curse. Our curse is to have so much, but to take so little advantage of what we've been given. Pasyana pina pashiti, those who see but do not see. So, in this particular point, and we'll stop and take some questions. We can understand that Ravana accumulated his misfortune by his own stupidity. We've been given a, a, a fortune that we don't deserve, but the question is now what do we do with that? Do we take the example of Ravana and just become more and more arrogant? Or do we take a humble position and try to understand what we've been given and try to apply it properly within our day-to-day -day lives? Okay. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. We're just trying to follow in your footsteps, Maharaj. I came across this one statement by Srila Prabhupada, in which I really found that when I first saw it, I thought it would be very useful in my preaching. But when I use it, and I forget it a lot of times, but when I do use it, it's amazing. And Prabhupada says, simply right by remembering the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one will never be impeded in any efforts in their practice of devotional service. I mean, that's a powerful statement. So sometimes we don't really um, get it. We just, we kind of like read it and we think, all right. 
but then every time I've thought of the, you know, the lotus feet of the Lord in situations, and I find it, it's instant. It's immediately, it, it works. It's just, wow. And these are like, you were talking about divine intervention, but these are like the more subtle forms of divine intervention, yeah. which comes by just statements by the great personalities. And remembering those things, you know, can make a big difference in how we actually are developing our, our faith in Krishna consciousness. And once that faith starts to develop, we, uh, we can start to understand, you know, that anything the pure devotee says has, you know, the backings of the Supreme Personality wow. of Godhead. So that, you know, I was really, that was one thing that I had found. There was another thing that Prabhupada said. He says, for those who, who speak and give lectures, he said, by saying, Oma Gyan Timirandasya, Gyanajana Salakaya, Chaksu Unmritam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru He said, you will, you, will, you will destroy all obstacles in your presentation. Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, these are, I mean, these little things that, yeah. apparently little things that it, it's just like, you know, if we pick up on these things and, you know, they, they lead to bigger re understandings of the whole process. And so, but the thing is, because we're not really always imbibing this in a real, what we say, even though we know it, we might forget it, or situations cause us to, to not remember it. You know, we don't always take advantage of that. And as you were saying, we have so much, but we gain so little from what the, what the knowledge we have. So again, the application is what is important. And then how to apply it, I think you also mentioned that too. It's the, it's the mood that is applied. And the mood is in the mood of service. Yeah. And so thank you. I just wanted to bring that point up because I was inspired by what you said. Just saying what we heard from you, Raj. But it's so ex it's so well, it's exciting. Really amazing. It's so thank exciting. You. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. So okay. Do Matthew share the call? How do I hand up? Thank you for a wonderful presentation. <coughs> My question related to the preaching to that uh, secret society, oh. I'm a little concerned because, uh, you know, Adolf Hitler used the Vedas, and we know the Holocaust happened because he used all the principles mm -hmm. to perpetrate such terrible genocide. So... While as devotees, we certainly want to change the world, we certainly want to preach, I was wondering whether we should exercise caution when dealing with maybe people who are into black magic or doing crazy things that mm. they're trying to use these principles to perpetrate evil. And then how does a devotee know in a situation not to be naive? So maybe you could shed some light on that. Very good question. Um, okay. There's a statement that I read earlier this year by Prabhupada. He said, there's no injustice in the material world, which is a really strong statement. And what, he un what I understood by that is he's saying that what we're going to experience is due to based upon something that we've done before. Right? So what we do is we demonstrate and live the activities properly. You see, in one sense, people who misuse anything it's a sign of foolishness. Because, it, it, as in the past times of Ravan, when you do something wrong, the only person you're ultimately going to damage is yourself. You see the point? It, that you can't avoid. If people, do, if people misuse something, they get, it's, it's actually, they've cursed themselves. Right? But what we should do is we should live and realize the teachings so that we can s show people there's no point misusing it. You're not going to be happier by misusing it. You're going to be happier by, by following it. See, the, the basic point is that everyone's looking to be happy. Everyone. It doesn't matter what they do. 
it, we're not different to the materialists. Everyone wants to be happy. It's just that they've got a different idea of how to be happy than what we think will make us happy. The goal is the same, but their, their idea of how to achieve, we're like, that's not going to work. Right? You know, the kind of, you know, all these like sinful, like, that's not going to work. But if you do it this way, it will actually lead to lasting happiness. So, yeah, I think there's all these, naturally we shouldn't be naive. It's not that, I'm not going to get into it, but sometimes people who are into metaphysics and so on, they're not necessarily always bad people with bad intention, necessarily. But we should preach a teaching as it is, and we should try and give it in such a way, according to what Prabhupada has given, his instructions, and try to encourage and inspire people through our own example to take it in the right way, to live it as it's given. And we also, and the scripture does this very well, we also see examples of what happens when people misuse the teachings. It's not just Ravana, there's so many demons, and they know Shastra, they do austerities, and ultimately the whole thing falls apart. Because if you still, even if you take the ultimate teachings, but you use it with the wrong motive, for a demoniac end, not to surrender to Krishna, but to try to you know, have some kind of demoniac position, ultimately you'll get chastised. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Which part have I missed? No, no, no. I may, no, I may have missed something. Was there a section of, was there an aspect of your question that I didn't cover? Well, uh, definitely in the broader sense that if someone misuses, they're going to get a reaction. Yeah. But at the same time, we don't want to be sort of accomplices to the crime, so to speak. Yeah. So I was just wondering how you could help us be cautious about which arenas we are entering into yeah. so that we don't become part of the, you know. Sure. So the j basic principle is you, you give people according to their situation. So, for example, the general thing is we give people the chanting. That will always purify a person. There was, I was chair of governors for one school, and there was a letter that was written by one mother. Of one, her son goes to this school, and the school has, you know, Krishna conscious principles interwoven into it. The chanting is part of it in the, in the morning assembly and different things. And the woman wrote to the, um, the school, and she said that before coming to this school, because the son's not a devotee, he's at the school, there are devotees and non-devotees all at the school. And she wrote saying that before coming to the school, my son was very badly behaved, always causing trouble, getting into fights, all this kind of stuff. But since he's been coming into your school, right, his, his character's completely changed. Completely changed. They're not from a Vedic background, anything like that. From a Western background, she said, but, but, but since coming to this school, I've seen his entire character has changed. It's just the efficacy of the holy names. Right? So we give people Krishna consciousness, but you give them what they will actually what they need, and also you give it to them in a way that they will be able, they will not be able to misuse it. Ideally, yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you pass the microphone to Maharaj? Can you confirm this? Is that the ninth offense to the holy name? Yes. Yes, to instruct the faithless person of the glory. So to, to, miss, to give them more than they actually can um, properly appreciate. That's yeah, definitely. so that's our cautionary yes. you know, statement. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Maharaj. Any last question? I don't know if you want to go to <laughs> lunch. Oh, I saw the hand on this side, if that's okay. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. In the beginning, you say about narration. Yes, uh, but I think, uh, thinking about uh, 11 Kanto, uh, Krishna say to Udava, mm. uh, I have solution for every single person. I have also a realization that intelligent <laughs> person uh, have to every day read the book, but, but Without break, read the Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we, have, we have a solution for every problem in our life. Yeah. No argument there. Completely agree with that. Thank you for sharing. I think this Mataji had her hand up as well. So maybe we'll have that as the last question, then we'll go to lunch. Thank you. 
questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering if you have any uh, practical uh, suggestions uh, how we are able to, to manage to, to engage everybody according to their nature because there are two approaches as I, I saw that uh, sometimes uh, uh, we find out what services uh, to be uh, according to what are the natures of the devotees uh, but sometimes there are certain services and we have to find uh, who to, to do them. And in this case, it's, it's more difficult to, yeah. to do it like that. Yeah. So what is the solution for, for this? Very good question. Would you like to answer Marge or because I, I could share something after. Okay. So, yeah, this comes up a lot and, I, and people have asked me this before. So first of all, I think it is important to acknowledge and show empathy for those people who are in positions of management within our movement and those people who manage projects because it can be very difficult when you're managing a project and you know that certain things need to be done and you want to get them done for the, for the good of the Vaishnavas and then they'll devote, well, no, Mataji, I'm not going to do that. That's not my nature, you know, and so it's kind of like, how do we make sure that we get this done, considering that people don't want to do this or don't want to do that? It's a misunderstanding of how these things work. I remember, that I'll share a few things. There was a class by Bhakti Tirta Maharaj. He said that, it's very interesting, he said that the devotee should be ready to do whatever the, the need is, right? He said at the same time, those who are managing and organizing wherever possible should try to engage people according to their nature. You see? So if both sides are trying their best to facilitate the other side, then it works. If it's one side just saying, no, you should just do what I tell you, that's not ideal. If the other side, I'm, I'm not gonna do, I'm gonna be inflexible, I'm just gonna do what I like doing, that also can be an issue. However, the more that we try to organize this gone properly, if you do, again, this is another thing in terms of application, if we did give more thought to engaging people according to their nature, you would see that you'd get more people. You see, this is, so nothing happens in isolation, right? So if we gave more thought to engaging devotees according to their nature, they would all achieve more. Because when they do something according to their nature, they're more productive. I think Marge mentioned that earlier. So now, instead of that devotee bringing in 10 people, they bring in 100. So you as a manager, you have 100 people to take on the, the different responsibilities rather than 10, right? So actually, nothing is independent. When we try and do our part, if I do what I'm meant to be doing, this is one of the things I've been thinking about a lot. If each and every one of us, if we do what we're meant to be doing in this movement, right? if we try to um, do what Krishna wants of us, that will create an environment where it will inspire other t people to do what Krishna wants them to do. Make sense? And by doing that, things will really expand. I remember being in one seminar um, by John the Mullen Marge, and he was talking about, he, it was a material from Sureshwara um, Prabhu's seminar, Our Founder Acharya. And so what Maharaj did is he gave a chronology of different statements that Prabhupada made about Varnashram over time. So when Prabhupada first was talking about Varnashram, he said it wasn't going to be possible in the modern society. But over time, he came to the point before he left saying that this Varnashram must be instituted, that we must do it. And one of the reasons was he was seeing that people were not able to continue on in Krishna consciousness because of the way that they were situated. So we have to have faith in the founder Acharya, but we also, and this is one of the things I see that we, we as devotees, we don't do, we don't think. We're so much into acting and running around that the thought behind it, the strategic thinking behind it isn't always there. So if we take a bit more time to think, then we can arrange better in such a way that we can get more result. But it's, it takes cooperation. And the truth is, practically, there's a few things. One is we should lead by example. Wherever possible, we should try and act and, and offer the best quality service we can wherever possible. Second, we have to build relationship. What I see is that we often tell people what to do, we don't inspire them. You see? And therefore, when I, when I just push, right? If, if I came up to one devotee, let's, let's try this. If I come up to Sri Kala, I'm going to put my hand out like this, I'll give you the same. I'm just going to push, right? Listen. <laughs> if I push, what do I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If 
I come up to, I'll be shaking my, my hand up, what happens? So we often try to push. We try to push. Okay, Prabhupada says you're going to help. You're going to do this. So we just push. And even if it works in the short term, it creates that resistance. So the devotee may now submit because of pressure, but next time they just avoid, I'm not going to do that again. They were senior, they saw me, so next time I won't help. But if we build this relationship, and if we do what our scripture does, which is to help people to see how by their engagement in service, it's a blessing and benefit to them. If we do that in a way that's inspiring, people will naturally come along. You know? So we want to inspire people to do the right thing. And, and it's, very un it's very simple, because otherwise, if people keep pushing you to do something that's right, but you don't have any relationship, you don't feel that they, they care about you, you think that they're just saying that because they want something and they have no, in, in, no concern about your well-being, are you going to continue to always do that for them? Mm -hmm. No. So we're people. You know? So these dynamics are both important. It's not just what we want. It's how do I, how do I approach this person in order to help them to understand that by engaging in this way, it is for their benefit. Because that's how Krishna acts. Krishna gives us the teachings, and these teachings are for our benefit. Mm -hmm. He wants us to follow so that we will be blessed and benefited by following. It's not, because of, it's not some idea that I'm going to punish you unless you do what I tell you. It's, that's not the mood. Right. That's, not, that's not Krishna's mood. His mood is, I care about you, therefore I'm suggesting you should live like this. Because if you live like this, you, what, is, what does this Shastra say? Um, Devotional service has to be unmotivated and uninterrupted in order to completely satisfy what? Yourself. The self. You're satisfied. Isn't that amazing? That we, he's suggesting you do devotional service purely without motive because if you do it like that, you'll be incredibly satisfied. And anything below that, you actually won't be happy. Make sense? Okay. Is there anything, Marge, you'd like to add to that? Mm. You went a little bit away from what I was going to say, but that's good. Yeah. I was just thinking of the example of, you know, the, you know, when you push the resistance and when you offer, you know, how that, mm -hmm. you know, brings about a more, you know, uh, harmonizing relationship when there's two two different examples but I'll, I'll take I'll take the second one I thought of there was this lady who was coming to uh, the temple this was in the early days and this was in Europe and it was pretty pretty much a temple based movement at the mm -hmm. time we didn't have much of a congregation so this lady was coming and she had the habit of dressing very uh, lavishly and what we say there was less than what should be on the body in terms of clothes. So, you know, <coughs> she came into the temple, and she had a mini skirt on, her hair was all, you know, and she was all, you know, decked out. And so the devotees were being a little upset. She thought they wasn't, she wasn't probably being, you know, demure enough or, you know, chaste enough to be in the temple looking at the deities. It was disturbing the devotees. So they, they asked her, you know, you can keep coming, but please, you know, you should dress a little, you know, chase. But she was attached, and she came again, and then they made the same point again, and every time she came two or three times, and then the points got heavier, you know. So finally, she actually got discouraged and said, I'm not going. The devotees don't want me to go. But then Prabhupada was scheduled to come, and it was right after that, and she heard about it. She, w she was interested because she was reading Prabhupada's books. So uh, she decided, I'm going to go meet the spiritual master. So Prabhupada had sat down. He was all ready to speak. She came in the same way. Mini skirts, all hair, and everything. And she came in, and she, she's looking for a place to sit down. Prabhupada noticed her. So he said, oh, thank you for coming. You look very nice today. <laughs> <laughs> how, how she felt is like melted her heart. He didn't say anything more. He just welcomed her and then honored her for, as a you know a, a person as a spirit soul. That night she went home, took her hair down, yeah. dressed differently. She said, "If this pleases the devotees, I'm going to do it." Yeah. <laughs>
it was just, it's just, yeah. It was just Prabhupada's way yeah. of honoring a person instead of like, you know, the devotees were like, yeah, you know, you're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have to get out of that, you know, that self-righteousness. Another example was, you know, one devotee wasn't following anymore. He had long hair, he was smoking all kinds of stuff you shouldn't smoke. And he came to see Prabhupada. Prabhupada never said anything. He said, can you do this service? That's all. He knew if he tried to preach to him about what he was not doing, yeah. it will automatically believe that, you know, that resistance. But he just engaged him in service. And after some times, by engaging in service, he started, started to change. This is probably said, I have some service for you. C can you do it? Yeah. And immediately he said yes. So yeah, it takes a certain type of, uh, I guess, vision to, I mean, you can explain that better than I can. No, I can't. <laughs> but yeah, it's just such wonderful, wonderful examples. I, I really feel that, I almost did a seminar on this earlier this year, but we didn't have time, but um, yes, devotees, we could be more emotionally intelligent. We really could be more emotionally intelligent in how we deal with each other and how we deal with others. I I'm just going to share this with you. Right now, there are ways in which the movement could be promoted a lot, a lot more. I mean, literally, because the way that things are, social media and other things, you could promote the movement a lot more. But the question that even many people ask is, even if, even if you did that, when people come, how would they be treated? You see? So it's not enough to put the packaging on the movement. You have to have something that they can come to that's going to be aligned with what they've been actually told about the movement. If, they, if it's presented as this very wonderful, great spiritual thing and everyone's blissful and ecstasy, and then they come and they're mistreated or they're treated in a harsh way or there's no understanding or treated impersonally, in the outside world, think about it. If you, went, if, you, if you were in your workplace and a stranger came, you wouldn't just shout at them and tell them what to do. You would feel that's inappropriate, right? They're a stranger. They don't know you. You're not ha you don't have any authority over them. You would, you would actually act in a different way, but we sometimes forget that as devotees, which is strange, which is strange. We, we, don't, we forget that we're dealing with real people with real feelings. Right? And that's our impersonalism. That's our impersonalism. And that is a huge hindrance to preaching and bringing people to Krishna consciousness. Right? Because that impersonalism is, an, is a behavior that goes against the teachings that we're trying to present. Yeah? You can't present a, a personalist philosophy, but you act impersonally. Because what they do is they look and see the activity above and beyond what's being said. So there's a contradiction now. So we're actually counteracting our own teachings by the way that we deal with people. You know? And then it becomes an issue. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll stop there. You know, I think we'll continue a bit later on around um, maybe five o'clock. Thank you very much for your time. Sri Ram Nav Miki Chai. Sri Prabhupada Ki Chai. Jan Saikopan Nandi. Hare Krishna, everyone. Literally, when I was sitting there, all I could hear was every other minute, everyone going, wow, wow. Like everything that Bhutan Abhav and Prabhu was saying, you guys were like so tuned in. We're so fortunate that we have actually got another session with him at five o'clock. So um, it's true what, when he was saying he um, coaches others to become leaders. I think if you need to coach someone to become a leader, you need to be a leader yourself. So it clearly exhibits all those qualities of a true leader. So can we give another round of applause, please? Um, so what we have now is we have lunch scheduled and a bit of free time. Um, but tomorrow our Croatian and Slovakian devotees are leaving quite early. So we thought today it would be nice to get a group photo with everyone. So maybe if everyone could meet here back at 2.15 and then we can take a group photo. And um, the next session we have is at 2.30 and that's um, key messages from His Holiness Chandramurya Swami. So these messages, um, it's like his official disciple meeting for his disciples. 
but Maharaj just said everyone's welcome. So you can all join in this room for 2.30 prompt, please. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.